Not too long ago, the Nintendo Switch launched to critical and consumer acclaim. People that had fallen off the Nintendo bandwagon praised the system for being a game system first that, other than the portability, didn't hinge on some sort of weird gimmick like motion control or a tablet controller. More recently, Nintendo Labo was announced, showing off all the weird and cool things that the Switch's included controller, the Joy-Con, can do. Lots of people looked at this as a big surprise, but really, Nintendo has had a history in innovative controller design and gimmicks going all the way back through its history. Some of these gimmicks are now main features in nearly all controllers, Nintendo or otherwise. Today, I'm going to go through Nintendo's long history making gaming hardware to prove that in many ways, Nintendo is a controller company. Contrary to most Westerners' understanding, Nintendo's first venture into video games wasn't the widely popular NES. Nintendo had a line of fairly successful arcade, TV, and handheld games before the NES even launched as the Family Computer, or Famicom, in Japan. Even in those earliest of days, the nature of arcade games meant that controls had to be unique to stand out. If a game looked too derivative of another, the consumer would just pass it up. This, in combination with other products like the Game & Watch and Color TV game lines, meant each product had its own specific controls for its games since each product was built to play a single type of game. It's no secret that the NES was Nintendo's first worldwide hit. In fact, people often credit it with digging the games industry out of an infamous death spiral of record low sales industry-wide. The quality, simplicity, and technical prowess of the system were huge reasons for its success. In my opinion, the NES controller itself perfectly personified these traits. At the time, controllers were a mess. Look at the Atari 5200's controller. It had 12 face buttons and a joystick whose position essentially made you cover up those 12 buttons. The NES controller had just two face buttons, forming a binary that was easy to keep track of without needing to look at your hands. Along those lines, the D-pad, first implemented by Nintendo in the Game & Watch series, came standard on the console. The D-pad's simplicity and compact nature, along with the at-the-time ergonomic design, helped you forget you were holding a controller and let you just worry about what was on screen. Even from an early era, Nintendo knew how to innovate, refine, and experiment with control interfaces. Hell, the Japanese Famicom even had a microphone in its second controller, famously used in the first Zelda and Takeshi's Challenge. Nintendo's next console, the Super Nintendo, was all about iterating on what had come before it. Still, if you look at the controller of the SNES, there's a lot going on. Firstly, there were a few things that Nintendo kept the same, like the general size and format of the controller. We see an addition of an X and Y button. Nintendo tried a couple of ways to make it simple to remember what was where, from different colors, to sectioning them off, to having one set of the buttons being concave and the other being convex. Again, if you weren't looking at the controller, you were focusing on the game. The other main addition here is the shoulder buttons, L and R, that many developers admittedly didn't know what to do with. Still, while the improvements made by the Super Nintendo were mostly simple iterations on the NES, these iterations are ones that would soon become industry standards that are still used today. You'd be hard pressed to find a modern controller that doesn't have four face buttons and at least one set of shoulder buttons on it. The Nintendo 64 is where Nintendo really went off the rails, for better or worse. The N64 controller is notoriously one of the ugliest controllers ever made. However, we typically don't lump it in with Xbox's Duke, the Saturn controller, or other examples of bad controller designs, and that's a direct result of the N64's major contribution to gaming, the analog stick. Every 3D game utilizes at least one analog stick, and the N64 is the home console that made that standard. Instead of, say, needing to hold a button, you could now tilt the analog stick all the way if you wanted your character to run, while a slight tilt of the stick would cause your character to walk or even tiptoe. While the N64 did have a D-pad and an alternate grip for holding the controller, you typically never used it. That's how hard Nintendo nailed it with the analog stick. Another often overlooked feature of the N64 was that it was the first home console to utilize haptic feedback, also known as Rumble, with the Rumble Pack, first sold with Star Fox 64 in 1997. These features were so much of an improvement for 3D games that the original PlayStation controller, which was essentially just a more ergonomic SNES controller with two extra shoulder buttons, was phased out in favor of the DualShock controller, adding rumble as well as dual analog sticks. The N64 may be one of the most baffling controllers to look at, but there's no understating its importance in the video game landscape. The step from N64 to GameCube can be looked at as Nintendo once again iterating on what came before. The best example of this is my personal favorite feature here, the trigger buttons. The GameCube wasn't the first home console to use trigger buttons, but they did use them best out of any of the other 6th generation gaming systems, and arguably all generations beyond. Aside from the ergonomic quality of the triggers being pressed with the entire finger, their dual purpose is what's so unique about them. You can press them in as you'd expect, but after a certain point, they click into place. It's a hard tactile feel to get across with words, but imagine playing Mario Sunshine without locking Mario into place with the triggers while using Flood. While not standard in new systems, the GameCube was the first home console to have a first-party wireless controller in the Wavebird. 
Nearly all games now are played with a wireless controller, and in many ways, you have the GameCube to thank for normalizing that. Aside from the major things, the face buttons on the GameCube got a slight redesign that potentially helped eliminate confusion while playing, as well as comparison with other systems. Some controllers may have had identical buttons and features, but none of them looked or felt like this. The GameCube controller's features are why it's still considered by most to be the best video game controller of all time. You don't need me to tell you that the Wii controller was a major departure for Nintendo and the entire video game industry, but here I am doing it anyway. Motion control worked well enough and simply enough that the Wii was one of the greatest selling consoles of all time. For games that used less or no motion control, you could plug in different modules or in some cases just turn the controller sideways, in essence making it an NES controller with more buttons. In an effort to make the Wii controller more accessible to the market it was vying for, they switched out the four face button configuration for a more spacious design and a single binary trigger button in place of moving triggers as well as relegating analog sticks to attachment peripherals like the classic controller or the included nunchuck controller. After the huge success of the Wii, the seventh generation consoles all experimented with motion controls in some capacity, to varying successes. While not a home console, I wanted to quickly touch on how Nintendo innovated with player interfaces with the DS's touchscreen. In the modern era, it's easy to take for granted since everything from phones to cars to fridges now have touchscreens on them, but the DS was one of the first instances of consumer electronics using a touchscreen to wide success. It took a while for the concept of asynchronous gameplay to catch on and be accepted, but to date, systems in the DS and 3DS families have sold over 200 million units. Asynchronous screen gameplay was a proven hit with the handheld market, and Nintendo intended to bring that feature to their next home console, the Wii U. The Wii U was unfortunately one of Nintendo's biggest financial disappointments. Analogous to how the successes of previous systems had to do with their controllers, some or at least part of the failure of the Wii U had to do with its controller. The Wii U controller is actually a step backwards in terms of button functionality, taking the Wii's example of ditching analog triggers for buttons despite going back to a four-face button, two-analog stick design. The main feature and would-be selling point of the Wii U was the touchscreen on the gamepad itself. In practice, it was pretty useful in terms of switching items and other functions in games. The problem came in the form of its highly unappealing look, as well as touchscreen gaming already reaching ubiquity. The iPad had launched earlier that year, and the iPhone had already been out for about five years. So where the DS found success in a feature utilized before Apple, the Wii U arguably failed because of a feature utilized far after Apple. This brings us to the now current system, the Switch, whose Joy-Con controllers pack in an insane amount of tech in a tiny footprint. Each Joy-Con is capable of motion controls as well as a feature called HD Rumble. HD Rumble is essentially multiple haptic feedback sources that can give varying intensities. So instead of one intensity over the entire control surface, you can now feel left, right, up, down, intense, or subtle vibration. As of now, it's a fairly underutilized feature, but some games have used it to great effect. Think of it like 5.1 surround sound over mono. Another smart, well-known feature of the Joy-Con is that they can detach from the console to be used in multiple configurations, including two-player, technically making the Switch the second Nintendo console packed in with two controllers since the Famicom in Japan. Furthermore, the Joy-Con have the familiar four-face button design for the D-pad, meaning that when split in two, the controllers are basically identical, which is a great example of a complicated problem being solved before it was an issue at all. When split apart, the controllers actually have their own shoulder buttons as well. However identical they look, they actually do have a few slight functional differences. The right Joy-Con has a proximity sensor in it, which is mostly used in games like 1-2 Switch, as well as the aforementioned Nintendo Labo. This is why simply putting a Joy-Con into a cardboard box with a couple moving parts creates a functional piano. The motion sensor can see all the moving parts and the Switch interprets what that means on the screen. Now, I'm not making this video to say that Nintendo is the best or always makes the best controllers 100% of the time. Motion control was really annoying, and the Virtual Boy controller had two D-pads. The Joy-Con controllers are tiny, they haven't brought back the GameCube trigger buttons, and the gamepad was a Fisher-Price nightmare. Other companies have had a great deal of innovations themselves. Sega's Dreamcast had a memory card called the VMU that was essentially a tiny Game Boy, which blew my mind as a kid. Valve Steam controller is... Interesting. Microsoft's constant iteration to the core concept of their controller is one of the best things about the platform. And Sony has had their own subtle unique features like the PS4 light bar and touchpad as well as the share button. In an industry obsessed with processing power, lines of resolution, frames, and teraflops, the control interface is an often overlooked feature of a system. However, it's important to remember that the controller is the real face of the system whose design is a direct communication from the manufacturer of how you're going to interact with that box hooked up to your TV. Really, the controller on any home console is the only real physical connection between you and the game. Shouldn't it be obsessed over? 
Hey guys, thanks so much for watching this episode of Entertainment System. Let me know what your favorite controller is, Nintendo or otherwise. If you're so inclined, you can also leave a little like down there and press subscribe and hit that bell so you get notified every time I make a video. And additionally, if you're interested, I do have a Patreon so you can help fund videos like this. And it also gets your name in the credits here. So with that, I hope you guys have a great day today and every day thereafter. Peace.